Hey friends, this is a conversation I had with John Coleman on his YouTube channel, also called John Coleman. That's kind of a common name, so the easiest way to go look him up is through the link that I'm going to put with the notes of this show. But he was interviewing me for his YouTube podcast, live stream, whatchamacallit, and we had a really great conversation about education, or indoctrination is maybe a better way of putting it. And I tried my best to work with John to explain kind of the reasons why the education system doesn't just prevent people from actually learning life skills, hold them back spiritually, but it also, in more or less, turns the people into order followers is what the best way to describe it is. And that's the design of it. So that's kind of a summary of where we're going to be going in this conversation. And it's really a good one. And we're going to pick it up where we leave off here in a future Interverse episode very soon where we talk about John's vision. So Definitely check this out to get introduced to the ideas that we'll be continuing to bounce around later on in a future show. Don't be turned off either that the audio quality on John's side of the conversation is is kind of sketchy. I was able to understand him well enough to answer the question. So if that's the case, then I trust you're smart enough to be able to understand him well enough to be comprehending my responses to his questions. So most of it's me talking because I'm the guest and that means that the audio problems on his side aren't really that big of a deal overall. And I think you can look past him for the good content. I personally had a lot of fun. I was kind of in a flow state. I'm interested in this topic. I think children are kind of a big deal since everybody was a children at one point. (laughs) Actually, the word children is problematic. I'm starting to learn more about the etymology and legal meanings of that word, but our young, our young men and women need to be raised properly. And that's a big deal because we're all young at some point. And maybe some of us are still kind of young maturity wise or understanding how to live life wise. I know that I struggle to do a lot of things that maybe just a few generations ago, people would have had down easily, like basic life skills, survival shit. Okay, but let's have fun with this conversation talking to John Coleman. I loved it, and I can't wait to do more. Thanks for tuning in. Go subscribe to his YouTube, and yeah, let's dig in. Okay, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Wa barakatuhu. Welcome, welcome, welcome to episode 64 of a con conversation with today we're hanging out with chance of interverse welcome chance hey john how you doing i noticed that as soon as we went live i got some static from the audio side of your end so uh, i'll keep an ear on that and make sure it resolves but i'm doing great i am excited to get to meet you and your audience and the topic that you've got on the table for us today is definitely something i'm interested in and try to explain aspects of to people all the time in my personal life when, you know, they throw up their arms in frustration and say, why, why is everything like the way it is? And I say, well, it starts with what happened when you were a kid. That's how it always has been. That's how it always will be. Excellent. And I certainly appreciate chance. Chance has, as we'll find out, quite an online footprint with his interviews and a man with, as you just heard now, an ear for audio and for production quality. So I definitely appreciate that. And uh, before we get going with our interview, we're going to talk to put um, a bow on it. We're going to talk about education, right? Uh, this this uh, event, which in many respects in the modern Western world has taken the role of uh, religion in, in the past 100 years or so. A lot of the energies that anxieties, and so forth, uh, that used to go in, into that, rightly or wrongly, are now put into the modern uh, focus of session uh, with formal learning. So we're going to get in, into that and uh, all sorts of nooks and crannies and chances, such a, an interesting and, and enthusiastic and enlightening outlook on things. I think we have the right man for, for our topic. Before we do that, um, one announcement can Starting up the Species and Institute for the Humanities. And that is if any of you kind guests uh, or viewers or members, Martians, aliens, and all, all sorts have writing or art that you would like to have published in the college's journal, Sense and Worth here in Connecticut, please send them to a Buckstastasis Institute at AOL.com. 
Uh, the theme for our journal is love and hate. It's a broad theme, but it is, um, you know, each, each edition has its own uh, parameters. But it's, it's certainly one I'm sure you all, their poems, uh, prose and fiction and whatever, have material for. So for this semester, please send that to me ASAP. With all that gibber jab, our chance, tell us a bit about yourself. Okay. Oh, you know how that question is. I'm a work in progress like anybody else and trying to pin things down with nouns and uh, per this permanent descriptions doesn't always work that well. But uh, right now I am a podcast host and I dabble with the other types of creative work on the side while I'm working on building up my world dominating podcast empire. Um, although I'm starting to wonder if that's going to be possible. It doesn't seem like... <laughs> I'm taking over the world yet, but anyway, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, what I really like to do is have fun conversations that are in some way pushing forward the envelope of understanding and trying to make knowledge into wisdom, which is applied knowledge applied properly. That is. So when I started doing the podcast that I do now, it was just because I was enthusiastic about having conversations with my friends that would be so deep and, uh, all encompassing that I thought other people would benefit from hearing this type of conversation. I bet not everyone gets to have this kind of conversation on a regular basis or maybe ever. Maybe these thoughts that I'm having and expressing with somebody, it, they're locked in someone else's head or in their heart and it's just a feeling. So that was my original motivation and getting into it, I realized it is something that you have to teach yourself how to do and there's a lot of process to that. And I had been recently experienced with teaching myself to do various other technical skills as I was exploring artistic and creative avenues. And so I came to the realization that, oh, talent is kind of a myth and it's actually a bad one. It's a harmful myth because it causes people to identify somebody outside of themselves as talented in, in one thing or another when Maybe they had an aptitude, but actually the real difference between the observer and the observed is the amount of time and effort and intention and will that went into creating whatever that skill set is or whatever that masterpiece was. And so it became clear to me that unless we have some sort of a physical defect and need to heal, we're more or less able to learn to do anything uh, and any way that we want to do it. But most importantly, that in the process of learning how to do something in one way or another, we'll come across our way of doing it. And that's sort of uh, your uniqueness expressing into the world. And it can come through in a lot of different avenues. My original interest in the show was talking to artists and creative people because it seemed clear to me that the void I felt inside myself was quickly starting to be filled in with love the more that I put time into creating and effort into creating and that before some of the deeper depressions of my early 20s were really rooted in the fact that I had no serious form of output of any kind other than that which was coming from authority. And in that case, it was college and school. And it was just follow these directions, these instructions, these parameters, this prompt, and then output. But this is something that we're going to talk about in this larger conversation about education is that we actually need the time to be self-directed, have self-directed output because otherwise, especially with the way society has been for decades, people just like sort of wait around and kill time until they're given their next order or their next directive. And we're moving more and more into that type of like notification driven stimulus response type of culture and society with social media in particular. I see it over and over again, a particular outcome or idea is desired by one group of people. So they inject that into social media and then it echoes around and people have the, they see other people having the specific reaction. So they say, Oh, I need to have that exact reaction too and change my profile picture to have this symbol on it or whatever the little show of virtue signaling happens to be. But at the end of the day, when is it like, if that thing mattered to you, why weren't you already talking about it? I mean, you're, following a trend, following a crowd. And crowd psychology is actually a really deep other topic that I think is well worth understanding because humanity has a tendency to be sort of like the, the locust. Whenever it's a solitary 
solitary insect it's one way but then when a certain threshold is reached of numbers and then they like things just totally change they swarm and people do that type of thing in their consciousness like this majority mindset that <laughs> the majority makes something right that this is all very difficult to actually put into terms of the natural world and what we observe nature doing and how nature works and Anyway, uh, this has gotten way off course from me talking about who I am, but there, there you have it. That's what I'm like. I just kind of start going and then <laughs> having fun with it, but I'll kick it back to you. Well, you know, you mentioned um, the type of stimulus manipulation on um, social media and things like that. And, and then that has a whole other dimension of, of censorship and control and steering narratives. But, you know, I... I remember in, in two events uh, um, within about the past five years in terms of social media which are quite peculiar um, in terms of my response to them and one of them was the it's something to do with the Supreme Court and um, the topic of homosexuality I think it has to do with marriage or something and there was this big celebration and another thing about two years after that had to do with ISIS and whether it it's uh, homosexuality or Islamic fundamentalism those aren't my uh, favorite. Uh, they're not, you know, particular topics that move me. And yet I still felt that internal desire to put on you know, the filter or to, <laughs> to put on the little Islamic state flag or something like that. And it, I, I was thinking how bizarre those are ideologies I'm particularly interested in. But I felt that that movement, that herd movement, because both of those things, you know, they were being uh, pushed by their partisan completely from different angles of, of things and, and different worlds. But that, when we consider social media, and, and we'll bring our topic back to education, but what we're seeing now is, this, you know, when, when we have an iPhone or something, or these social platforms, a lot of psychologists spend a lot of time on those things. And we need to be careful about being manipulated. And when we turn towards education, we have... Maybe something that's not as flashy as a filter or a, uh, a you know, light button or something like that. Something, you know, these primitive Pavlovian uh, trinkets that were given online. But we still have the same type of training that the powers that be in the West have spent a very long time studying and spent a very long time perfecting. And maybe we can turn our talk chance towards the nature of education. So how do you see it? And, and you even mentioned in your 20s that, you know, as, as much as myself in my early 20s, um, you know, kind of going through the flow and, you know, it takes a, a while, years and years and years after to really just first off to comprehend the training that we received and then to deprogram. So let's talk about just the system itself. Maybe we can start there. Okay, well, <laughs> I think I want to talk about, I'll just bring up the idea of the trivium method, which is an older idea in learning, which is a, a way of coming to the truth about something. And this is a topic I recommend people go look into for themselves and try to grasp. But there's a lot of different ways you can parse out what the trivium is. The trivium is three parts. That's why you get the try in there. And it's like input processing output to put it in computer language that's the most easy to understand way of parsing it out for people in 2020 before you might have called it like uh logic or uh, like see uh, knowledge logic rhetoric or something like that but the important phase to remember is that there's a middle phase in between input and output and what is pavlonian about our modern society is the fact that like people are being transformed to just become input and output without the real processing. And that's the part where you reflect with yourself about whatever it was the input was or the knowledge was before you decide what to do with it, how to, how to output it, what to tell other people about it in a sense. And this connects to like learning, for example, in the, the uh, amazing John Taylor Gatto essay, I guess it was a speech that you linked me from 1990, which makes it as old as I am, basically. He was talking about how the uh or i may have looked this up on a different a different research thread after reading the article but there's a point where i came across how 
the one room schoolhouses and the older way of schooling that took place in the country before it was like publicly uh, controlled. It was just run by local parents and stuff taking responsibility or hiring the right tutors. But the children would be different age groups all in one area. And so the older children would teach the younger children things that they already knew. And, and that took some of the pressure off of the however many teachers might have been involved because the uh, older children were also becoming teachers. And yo, know, everyone has heard this idea that you learn by teaching. That's completely true. You, you're just reinforcing knowledge that you already have by sharing it with another person. And then uh, the advantage of that is if you forget that you had that knowledge, that other person that now has it might be able to remind you later. So it's like <laughs> other people are like the external storage media in a computer metaphor for our, our information. And it's a really cool redundancy plan that nature has created for the preservation of knowledge and, and uh, you know, human progress. But it, if you go way back in time, the first thing that really happened to start to shift humans learning through the natural processes and from the natural world was like when things started getting wrote down in a way you could say that this is like what nature is trying to do, which is that you have more and more complex systems of information and instincts and, if, and uh, you know, hereditary genetic traits that are being passed forward through DNA and DNA could be looked at as like the ultimate hard drive storage system that never kind of never ends. It's an unbroken chain across the planet from the beginning to the end. But the problem I'm pointing out here is that when knowledge was shared orally from in the past and any civilization in the past that had that as a primary practice, the person speaking the knowledge to the person receiving the knowledge had the opportunity to make sure that they received it in the correct intention, like that they get, they get it, right? But now everything that we have being written down and this starts with scriptural text and that's a side topic, but now it's like we're getting people's interpretations of a dogmatic text. And then uh, we're, we're missing the spirit of the transmission of wisdom and knowledge from person to person, how that really works on a spiritual sense. And it's difficult to explain what that process is, but it's a type of like reflection and self-knowledge whenever we are giving our knowledge to somebody else. So big, it's a big factor in this chain of events that the part where the children are able to teach other children stuff they know is taken out of the education system. I mean, <laughs> what a, <laughs> the indoctrination system, you could call it. It's taken out. And um, now whenever they want to actually express like teaching each other things, it's usually like in the, on the back of the bus telling them what they think <laughs> sex is and how that works or, or whatever. And anyway, it's, it's all gotten very far away from this older idea of learning, which was the trivia method where, um, and, and I want to bring out this quote here about the calculus of time that the children, this John Gatto was, was teaching, were working with. I believe he was just taking the average of time of the week uh, that people in 1990 would do different things. And so Chance, before you uh, say that quote, uh, just as a background here, uh, John Gatto was Teacher of the Year in New York City, I believe, if not New York State. And the article that Chance and I will be going back and forth is his acceptance speech from 1990 that will be in the description of this video on BitChute and on YouTube. So please, as an active audience member, please do your reading. And so check that out and then... Uh, hit unpause. Uh, and with that chance, let's hear about that calculus of time. Right. I think that this is uh, probably worse now than it was back then, I'll say. And we can talk about how and why that is. But in 1990, out of the 168 hours in each week, children sleep an hour average of 56, leaving them 112 hours a week out of which to fashion a self. And I like how he puts that because this is really crucial. He says, he's talking about the, the average children in his classrooms. He says, my children watch 55 hours of TV a week, according to recent reports. So that leaves them 57 hours a week in which to grow up. My children attend school 30 hours a week, use about six hours getting ready, going and coming home, and spend an average of seven hours a week in homework, a total of 45 hours. 
During that time, they are under constant surveillance, have no private time or private space, and are disciplined if they try to in assert individuality in the use of time or space. That leaves 12 hours a week to create a unique consciousness. Of course, my kids eat, and that takes some time. Not much because we've lost a tradition of family dining, he says, which is, yeah, even further fallen by now, I'm sure. But if we allot three hours a week to evening meals, we arrive at a net amount of private time for each child of nine hours. So I think that's really generous, actually. Uh, <laughs> but he, one thing he says a little further down is that's a generous amount of time. I mean, they probably have less time than that now. But these things, oddly enough, are more just a more cosmetic way to create a dependent human being unable to fill their own hours, unable to initiate lines of meaning to give substance and pleasure to their existence. Yeah, so it's a national disease, this dependency and aimlessness. And I think schooling and television and lessons, the entire Chattanooga idea has a lot to do with it. So he's right on the money with that. It's basically uh, t your time is completely controlled when you're a child all the way up till, I mean, if you continue after um, high school into college, this is what I saw when I got into college. In a, in a way, you're still in, in the school system because you've got uh, the... A same amount, if not more, probably more coursework, of course, uh, than you did in high school. But now all of a sudden you're like in a dorm and you have free time to yourself and there's no mom and dad telling you you got to go to bed at this time or whatever. So mm -hmm. to get real, what happened to me my first year in college and I had pretty average, but like high quality average parents <laughs> was I spent the whole year like basically just playing video games and ended with a 1.0 my first year semester or my first year of college the two semesters combined unbelievable had to like reapply to get back into the school at the university <laughs> of missouri had to go in under a different department and everything which is great because ironically it was journalism school i got kicked out of and now i'm kind of like a renegade style of journalist but <laughs> independent i went back in for an english major which ended up being a lot more useful for me because i was able to become symbolically literate and that was that was it once i had the analytical mind of looking at things as symbols and interpreting in a young end since my own life the way i would a dream it was over it was over i was like now i was in the synchronicity flow and it just i still took a lot of time to uh, build a unique consciousness for myself out of that but those first couple of years of college were crazy i just remember like what animals the other boys in the dorm that i was in were like just wild destroying things like no no respect for any aspect of that authority institution or anything. And it's ironic because by the time they get out of there, they will most likely be in some way or another, finally settled down and conforming and respecting the authority and, or they won't graduate more or less. So it's like, it's like a crucible that this whole education system, especially all the way up to like age 21 and beyond with, with universities, it's a crucible that creates obedient, order following people that without the orders to follow, without the social cues and directions being given to them, then they just feel aimless. So that's a, that's a bad feeling. I see it in a lot of people around me and my, my age is that they have a feeling of aimlessness or they cover up that feeling of aimlessness by making themselves stay as busy as possible. But the fact is you shouldn't really feel aimless in life. Actually, your only real responsibility to life is to live it honestly and not destroy the place you live or harm others or yourself intentionally. So, I mean, it's pretty easy, but there's like the celebrity culture that goes into it because the half of their existence is spent watching TV. Now it's the internet, of course. And that side of things is like making you feel that if you don't have this image, then you are worthless and, and then basically you're aimless until you attain something that's going to help you build up like this uh, external internet persona to live off of now, which is what a lot of people are having to do. And uh, one last quote I'll throw in is really short one. I don't remember where I read this or who said it, but <laughs> the internet used to be an escape from reality. Now reality is an escape from the internet. Uh. And that's where the real programming is coming through now is through the internet. It's like the more, and video games, actually, which is a side topic. I'm intending to do a series on that, like <laughs> programming of video games. It gets pretty heavy duty these days. It's a bigger budget than Hollywood ever was. Wow. Uh, where, to, where to approach things? There, there's a lot to get into there. I think part of that aimlessness of 
of us of of this generation that's a fascinating word i know you like words i've seen you riff off of you know the plays on words on your on your podcast um that's an interesting word generation you know the people that were generated at about the same time in history a generation but um one of the the features that you mentioned is this aimlessness that we have in this this modern west and you know um chance and i have shared a guest Clint Richardson, um, who, who's mentioned um, quite a bit uh, concerning the legal system. That's kind of his, his forte there, and more than forte. And, you know, one of the things, if you analyze the legal system, we're talking about aimlessness now, we realize everything is commercial, including war, everything, uh, romantic relationships are um, legalized in, in a commercial fashion, and on and on and on. And you can see, even before 2020, you could see the aimlessness of people. Um, but you certainly see that now because in the modern deracinated commercial West, we have shut down commerce or severely handicapped commerce with, with this COVID stuff. And people don't know what to do. They don't, they literally don't know what to do with their time because it's, they've been so uh, programmed to use a word that's come up a few times in this record and it's so pro- and the entire reality of the Western man is, is commercial at this hour. It's not spiritual. It's not literary. It, it's not meditative. It's not artistic. Those things are tolerated, but it is primarily through a commercial setting. And um, where I was going with that is this aimlessness is also the field of education itself has found itself like Dante lost in a wood. You know, you have uh, modern pedagogy, modern compulsory um, state-funded pedagogy starting off, I believe, as actually a good thing in the 19th century. Um, I have a book here, it's several hundred pages. Um, the, the Life, this is the entire collection at least published. There's a Horace Mann from Massachusetts. He's one of the founding fathers of American public education. He seems like a decent chap. Um, a bit with his head in the clouds, but uh, nevertheless, what happens to modern pedagogy is, especially at the time of the First World War, uh, the powers that be who started the First World War use that event uh, to come to the conclusion, well, people are just animals. They can't control themselves. So you have a public education system which was created to create a literate and engaged population all of a sudden dressed up with nowhere to go. All of a sudden, Sudden, the same ruling class, which was building up this industrial education, uh, you know, a teacher really no longer believes in democracy, but still has to keep up these, you know, elections every couple of years. But uh, they don't believe in the actual uh, ability of men to govern themselves. You can check out a documentary called "A Century of Self" on this point to show how um, that belief in men's rationality changes with the world wars. Um, so what you have is this industrial model and then it's used by the time you get to the second world war largely as a sponge to to uh sop up to sop up up um excess labor i mean that's that largely explains the initial motive for high schools for instance is to pull people off the labor market that's why the union and the labor unions to their discredit were so instrumental in pushing for compulsory um, high schooling around the time of the second world war and then you get, and this is the conclusion of my, um, my part here, uh, then you get to the late 20th century where academia in particular and, and grade school begins selling itself after Ronald Reagan and after, you know, the deregulation of everything. Now everything's just commercial and you find schools nakedly, you know, saying you should get a degree to get a job. And you find people actually, you know, using this language to the point you've got before um, COVID-19, which I do see as this potential, well, certainly will be a turning point, which way it'll turn, Chance and I can get into. But um, by the time you get to President Bush and, and uh, Obama and Trump, you have these men and, and their administrations and the mindset saying things like, we want you to be job ready from day one. And not even make a pretense, a pretense um, for a life of the mind or anything like that. So the education system as a field of, of vocation itself 
is aimless. It's just like students. It produces. <clears throat> well, it's aimless if you think that the aim is to actually create functional, healthy human beings ready for a life on Earth. But if you think that, then it's aimless. But if you if you have a different perspective on what it's for, which is to create obedient order followers, then it's actually working pretty well. You no, know, even still to this day, uh, not it's what's making it hiccup for people that they don't like about what they're seeing with it is that, well, we haven't taught them how to follow all of the social orders and cues. Like maybe we should, maybe we should be teaching them how to pay their taxes or, or whatever, <laughs> how to start a business, how to engage in commerce even more effectively. But it's still like, even at that level of starting your own business, there's regulations. You got to figure out how to not be breaking the laws that you don't know about yet. You have to hire people to tell you that stuff. But I want to talk about the drivers of the Prussian system, as stated by Wikipedia, because Wikipedia leaves some things out here. I look at this page and the history of the history of what education page on Wiki as well. And, uh, they don't really tell you much about the transition from private to public schooling in the early 19th century. But on the, the Prussian system page under the header drivers and hindrances, the Prussian system is what we have modeled our current system after. Horace Mann was largely responsible for bringing that to the United States as you brought him up. But OK, so <laughs> basically, I'm going to just paraphrase instead of reading this whole article, but they said that the concept of the education system faced strong resistance from both the top and bottom of the social hierarchy because major players in the nobility didn't want the peasants to become more literate and raise unrest, but the very poor wanted to keep their children around to use as labor for as early as possible for whatever what they're involved with. So then they say that the system's proponents overcame such resistance with the help of foreign pressure and internal failures, always convenient that foreign pressure exerted just to make the thing happen that you needed to happen. After the defeat of Prussia in the early stages of the Napoleonic Wars, the military blunder of Prussian drill and line formation against the levee en, ma en masse of the French Revolutionary Army in a battle. After that, the reformers and German nationalists urged for major improvements in education. So they just say that and they glaze past it, but... What does that mean? What What's this military blunder and drill and line formation have to do with why you need a better education system? Those two things don't seem like they go together, or at least it needs to be explained. Well, Wikipedia, leave it out. If you don't think that people need to know it, they leave it out. But what actually is going on there is that, as I understand it, the soldiers on the on the Prussian side were like, yeah, I don't want to stand here and die in this formation just because I was told to when I could just go home and you know, grow my potatoes or whatever and have a nice life. So it was all about that little problem. That's what lost them the war is that they didn't have the disciplined troops or whatever. But what that meant was that they just were like willing to think for themselves about whether or not they wanted to stand there and die. And uh, that's as I understand it. So, I mean, maybe it's disputable because Wikipedia doesn't explain it that way. But I, Wikipedia doesn't even tell you the why. They just said after this military blunder is when it shifted. So I think that that's the case here as well. And I think in the United States that that's the, the reason, but it's not necessarily just for military action. And in fact, commerce is a form of warfare if you really think about it, because you're trying to like exploit what you can out of other people as much as you can. And that, I mean, if we're all just like hooking each other up with what we could help them with, it would be a totally different world, but that's charity and charity is a bad word in commerce. But co I think commerce and warfare are pretty pretty similar concepts. And so you can apply the same model, especially because corporations use the same type of hierarchies and compartmentalization uh, strategies in their organization as do militaries. So anyway, I think that Actually, there's- Actually, I'll, I'll interject and, and say um, even more strongly that legally speaking, warfare on a battlefield is commercial. It has the four aspects of contract offers acceptance, collateral, and I always forget the last one, uh, offer acceptance, collateral, and value, I believe. But it's the four points. And it's, this is, you know, hey, we took Fallujah and it cost us a lot of blood. Or we, you know, that's why soldier, you know, goes, goes back to a coin and things like that if you break it down. Uh, so chances is hitting on a, a very uncomfortable reality. 
terminology of uh, at least modern legal warfare. This wasn't the case before the, the um, liberal revolutions of the 18th and 19th centuries necessarily, but this is the Roman system which, which has been revived. Exactly. Like a phoenix from the ashes, it finds a new place to call home and set up shop. And then when the time comes for the age to change, the, uh, <laughs> the powers that should not be, they fake their own death and then put on a different guy's costume and uh, they're, they're the next thing. But that's another conversation altogether, the, like the Babylon Roman system that has never ended. However, I find it very interesting that after this Prussian system is developed in starting in like 1850 and then going forward, European nations started to adopt it. It got brought over here. It's my understanding that Massachusetts was the first place to uh, institute a public state institute or state mandated state run education system. And that if I'm not incorrect about this, the National Guard had to come like stop parents from rioting or escort the kids to school or something like that because people were really against it. Because I think back then people had more common sense and they had an idea that maybe this is a bad idea to let the state have access to my child for their entire life until they're an adult. But anyway, what we see right after this is adopted or right after relatively quickly, especially for back then when things move more slowly after this is adopted everywhere, then we do get, I mean, we get a lot of wars in between and maybe they're like test runs, but then we get world war one where it's the ultimate meat grinder of humanity where people are literally just running into machine gun fire across giant open fields with no cover. And then, it, so it seems like it was a wild success, at least in that particular commercial venture that so many people were willing to like literally walk straight into the face of death when I, I you know, I, there's stories in world war one of the soldiers like singing across the, the lines to each other, like on holidays and stuff. They, I, I, it's just so mind boggling to me that on one hand, they would be able to recognize their shared humanity and both sing Christmas songs on Christmas during a ceasefire for a day. But then at the other hand, they'd be able to not just run across that field to their death, but also shoot down. That's the other big important part of it. Like human beings don't really want to kill other people, even soldiers, especially, I mean, anyone that has a little bit of common sense or a conscience, those are the same thing. Actually, if you break down the words, you, you know, not to do that. So <laughs> Yeah, it it's baffling to me because I, I don't know how anyone in the world could ever make me sit on a machine gun and mow down people running at me. I mean, if they were coming to kill me, I would still have trouble doing that. So <laughs> it's uh, it's wild. And it, it just di sort of has devolved from there, you could say, into more and more obvious levels of this type of Pavlonian conditioning, in my opinion. But the way that it's gotten away with is that half of it or more is from the TV. And then later in this generation, the internet and the video games and programming in video games is even more insidious in my opinion, because they actually have the person emotionally invested in the act of doing the thing, virtually speaking. And there's a whole nother conversation we had about like the video game and the avatar and how that connects to the pers the person and the persona in legal fiction and legal law. But the, like for one example that I want to, one quick example is I played this Spider-Man game from 2018. And not only did they have something that was basically coronavirus as a main part of the story and the whole city of New York being on lockdown, but Spider-Man at the end of the game, the player has to choose to take the, what they call the anti-serum, which is another word for <laughs> vaccine, I guess. And you have to decide whether to give it to Aunt May who's dying from this disease or virus, <laughs> or let the scientists make more of it, which would let Aunt May die, but you would save hundreds or thousands or whatever. So Spider-Man, as the player, like chooses to let Aunt May die to make more of the cure. And that was two, not even two years ago that before this COVID thing happened. So I'm like, who owns Spider-Man? Disney. Is Sony complicit with all kinds of shenanigans? Probably. I mean, Anyway, this is this is all happening to your kids. And most parents are not even really have their eye over the shoulder of what the kids play on the Nintendo Switch or the PlayStation, whatever number it happens to be. So as someone who is an avid gamer, I can pick apart all day the way that this works in uh, the media that people are consuming at a young age and how that ties in to help reinforce the worldviews created by the version of history given by the school, the version of science, especially given by the school and the version of justice and what what makes a hero and all of that. So 
<laughs> what makes the hero to most kids who play a lot of video games is that the hero is told what to do by authority X or Y or person who needs help X or Y. And then you execute that contract by beating the snot out of however many people required or killing them or <laughs> going and getting the, the items and transacting that way. But anyway, the, there's so much to that. I, I practically need my own separate YouTube channel to start breaking down what I see going on with video games as a, a well-seasoned expert in that particular field from years of time that would be wasted, but hopefully I can make something of it by like using some of what I witnessed there as a grounds for making content, explaining what's really happening today to so many kids. And that was a lot there. It sure is. It sure is a lot to, to digest there. Um, well, you, you could just, from uh, the modern Plato's cave of, of the video games, which may be um, what, what the old Greek had in mind in there. If he was uh, dividing the tea leaves into the future, you know, that little allegory of the cave and all that. I wonder when, um, I want to turn our discussion towards, shall we say, the spiritual damage of modern pedagogy. I wonder, Chance, if the problem isn't so much the training of obedience and following orders, but the ends towards which they go, and what I mean by that is getting back to the, uh, the French Revolution and the, the uh, liberal wars of the 18th and early 19th century, which Jenna, the battle that, that um, kicked the Prussians into, into high gear, uh, the battle of Jenna, what that uh, was part of represents it. Uh, a real, a real break that for, you know, we'll say the time, the, the middle period, for about a thousand years, there was, I would suggest, at least a damper put on the Roman commercial system by the church. That things were elbowed down, that until you had the, the American the French Revolution's commerce was, at, was, you know, at least had a boot on its neck. And what the liberal revolution the Enlightenment revolutions represent is a breakout of shopkeepers and a breakout of attorneys, meaning you had a class of people that were severely controlled by and, and, and dominated by the church, and they, like a Frankenstein, escape. And what you have then is this, this terrible, as I see it, this terrible snowball of commerce that gets out of out of, out, of, out of control in the truest sense. It was controlled for about a thousand years. And then you have the French Revolution with Le Bon Mas, the, the calling up that everyone in the state is the state. And that, that's, that wasn't the case in the medieval period. Um, you lived on the Lord's land and that sucked and, and you were a serf. But the Le Bon Mas, the idea that every single person is the state, has fearful ramifications um, in, in, for instance, you know, why you have uh, firebombing of cities, why you have the draft and things like that. Um, but you have this, this snowball and it starts at the late 18th into the 19th century of, you know, the French, everyone, because then the Prussians have to match like that. And it's almost like those old Looney Tunes where, you know, the guy pulls out a spitball and then Chance pulls out um, a slingshot. And then John, he pulls out a pistol, and Chance pulls out a machine gun. You understand? And getting back to the idea of, of um, discipline or following orders, it's that the yeah, it's not as I see it, and I'd like Chance to respond to this whole um, <laughs> this whole board of, of um, rejoinder here. I don't see it as being a problem of obedience or discipline, but so, so much of the fact that the end of the these things in the modern pedagogical system is dead. It's not anything higher um, like a spiritual reality or an artistic reality or some higher uh, human function. In, and if it were, I wouldn't necessarily have so much of a critique about, you know, the, the training. But the point is that the, all this discipline and order is simply to make good workers. So is it a problem? This is the point chance of all this. Is it, a pro is it the discipline itself? Often the following orders itself is a problem or the end of those orders that they're being used for? Well, I think it's really more the following with blind obedience 
that type of behavior being instilled in people, it's more the problem because anyone can make you an offer to do something and you can honorably decline if you want <laughs> to decline that offer. But what we see with things like the state in, in the West, for example, they make you offers all the time, but that you don't realize it's an offer. You think it's a requirement. Like, I mean, this hopefully won't annoy too many people, but like the wearing of masks as a mandate in, in your city, if that's been done, that's actually an offer. And I, I couldn't tell you the path you'd have to take to, to deal with it. But what if you ever were that? like in trouble or something, I'm sure that you could actually deal with that if you knew what you're doing and uh, prove that it didn't apply to you as a living a living man or woman but that you know okay so i think that that's the real issue is that the being trained to blindly follow means that you won't you'll associate the guilt or the karma or whatever of the act with the authority that assigned the act and then there's like this huge amount of traumatization that goes on to everybody all the time in society just by watching the news like if we are the state if you are the state john then that means that you're also the state that went and blew up that wedding party of people because they thought they were getting a terrorist when they blew it up with a drone or whatever. So, but did you do that? No, but now we have this like net of guilt cast upon the whole nation. And even I slip up all the time and say, well, we did this and we did that in some war or something. And I'm just like, I sure didn't do that. Actually, not, not at all. That wasn't me. I didn't have anything to do with that. But Commerce ties it all together because on an energetic level, you did do that because you're tied into the whole system and you pay their taxes and and then and then they've got most people believing that if you even took away that taxation, which is objectively theft, then because it's not consensual, then if you take that away, then now you're going to put up my roads and but my schools and all that. And but there was a time where my rhetoric involved a lot with the word anarchy, but I've really revised that from our mutual friend Clint and reading his work and coming to realize that, okay, if you're saying there's an anarchy, which is no masters or no rulers, that's great in concept. And like functionally speaking, an enlightened society would look like that, but an enlightened society could actually only operate under natural law. So the ruler or the archon in that sense would be nature itself or God or the creator or source or however you want to consider the absolute totality of existence and reality as it is that's what the truth is or that's what the creator is and coming to a better understanding of that term has helped me a lot to not think that i need to like apply the title to myself as anarchist or this or that but the reason why this matters is because you're talking about at one point that the education system is somehow crucial to make sure that there's people that are prepared to operate in democracy and be self-governing i've got news for you guys Democracy is not self-governance, actually. It is literally mob rule. And <laughs> not just the fact that like a group, a large group of people is called the mob, but that the government that we pretend is democratic, the federal government of this country and other countries, is actually the mob. Like like you were saying, before people believed that they are the state, you were just, you know, you, your feudal lord had the title over you. And you just worked his land or whatever. And it's actually still that way. Even if you think you own property, you can you can follow the paper and realize that actually you don't own that property. You're just receiving benefits on it. But and <laughs> responsible for its upkeep. But that's again, there's so many side side threads in this conversation that it, any one of them could be like their own conversation. But the point is that like true self-governance is actually uh, what I, I was getting at when I was talking about making natural law the authority for you or truth the authority instead of making authority the truth you make truth into the authority and that's actually that's like the real deal that's the higher level of humanity's spiritual attainment that's possible here and it's not something that we could all necessarily agree on every aspect of right away but that's okay because the foundational elements of natural law or you could even say, like some people refer to this as common law too. They're super easy because you already know them from the moment you're born, which is like, if you hurt somebody, you get an empathetic response, unless you're a trained psychopath or a primary psychopath, you'll know that you hurt them, right? You'll feel their pain. You can, you can empathize with them. And so you learn not to do that. And you learn that about other creatures as well. And you learn not to destroy the world around you because it's your support life support system 
the nature itself is. And so all these truths we hold to be self-evident, that statement is literally referring to nature because nature is self-existent. You don't have to prove that it exists. It obviously exists because we're here and we're part of it and we're in it. So whenever we take that highest authority of truth itself, what really happened and push that aside and say that like mankind can make the rules of what is and isn't true and what is and isn't right or wrong. I mean, even look at, look at law. How, how can some, how can law be real or true or morally correct when in this geographic location, the law says I can't do this thing. And then in this other geographic location, the law says I can do that thing. That automatically proves that it's not really like universal morality right? You're talking about statutory law, just to be clear. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of like a side, a a big side tangent, maybe. But uh, that's, if that kind of idea was being, if common sense and conscience were like part of how people were educating children, then it would be a lot harder for the mafias that we call governments to pull shenanigans on, on the people the way that they do. But the fact is, at this point, I mean, I believe in Italy, it's like, I don't know the percentage, but like a huge majority of people in that country, for example, are literally employed by the government in some way, receiving a paycheck from the government. And it's also known there that it's also organized crime syndicates are the government, the mafia. And like, I mean, I'm sure in Japan, you've heard of Yakuza. And here we've got all kinds of different shadowy mafia type organizations that operate in the background. People just call that the shadow government. But what I always like to say is government is literally the organized gang that people would are afraid would take over in the absence of government. <laughs> it's the exact same thing. And in terms of how governments operate with each other to their own people and in the like in the world, if like governments were individuals, how they interact with each other, they actually do already interact in a state of anarchy to one another. So well, people don't realize this, but we already have anarchy in a, a sense because we're the only thing that could be the true archon is truth itself or the reality or natural law or what we can observe to be self-evident and self-existing in nature and know from our own instinctual co- consciousness and empathetic common sense that we have of how we treat each other and treat other beings so if that's not the ruler well anything else that we pretend is the ruler can't really be the ruler because it's not really the ruler so we have anarchy and that's where I mean, that's what the order ab chaos thing is, I guess, about is that in that state of anarchy, the, the pirates can rule the high seas because there's there's no higher authority to deal with that. So uh, I think that's maybe too far of a tangent from what your original question is. So I better kick it back to you and see if we can get you on whatever track you want us. <laughs> no, I think that is a fine umbrella um, observation to make there chance the uh, statement that you made about us uh, in a modern legal bar association west living in a state of anarchy seems uh, really crazy especially when you have millions of statutes and more coming out every day including mask statutes and god knows what else that's that's predictively programmed well, the millions the of statutes proves it because no one could know millions of statutes in their mind and actually know if they're keeping them or not i mean it's obvious that it's organized crime not organized law because Anyone that's at the right level of the law and knows the law and has the proper authority can pull strings to get anybody in trouble with the law that they want. Because at any given moment, you probably you probably scratched your ass the wrong way uh, in the wrong town. And that's a tech, they caught it on camera. And that's actually technically illegal in that city. I mean, that was a stupid example. But it, some, everyone's doing something illegal somewhere, somehow, and they don't know it because there's so many of these statutes, including stuff that goes all the way back to like the 1800s that they never took off the books technically. So they don't, they don't follow their own, own rules except when it suits them. But that's actually why it suits us to start to learn their rules and use it against them in our own legal self-defense because then – because I mean – they have to technically follow them because they work in a hierarchical authority structure system. It's just our ignorance of, of the legal system and of natural law that keeps us easily subjugated by it. I think. Yes. A fine umbrella observation there. And, you know, people will go through their whole lives and not realize this system and returning to education and, and perhaps an out and a, a way to rebuild from this. I think we ought to analyze for a moment, Chance, the uh, psychic, the spiritual, the conscious 
damage that modern pedagogy does. And, and I'll throw a few out there and then see what you think about that. Um, um, one of which, and by the way, when, when I say modern pedagogy, I, I, I don't just mean public education or, or secular higher education, but I also mean with just as much uh, heft, I also mean homeschooling and and I also mean private schooling because it's actually the same system. That's what people don't understand. It, it's, it's the exact same system. Um, maybe the curricula is a little bit different and, and uh, a few superficial aspects. But we do have to remember that all have sinned in this regard. And we're all basically using the exact same model from the 19th century. This Prussian model, as Chance mentions. And, you know... We're thinking about the damage uh, that it does to us to get us to accept this society as expectations, and has led to you know, the listlessness we mentioned earlier. Well, one of the things I think about is just the damage of changing teachers every year, and as you get older, it actually speeds up. So you start changing teachers every you know every hour, then you know this sort of thing, and this does not allow the child to make and the older child uh, to make these deep interpersonal connections, um, much less the, the damage that's done changing, indeed, subjects with instructors, however well-intentioned, that don't quite know what everyone's already learned. So you have this, this uh, education that's an inch thick. To mention nothing of the physical um, disabilities, uh, that's not the right word, the physical disabilities in the old-fashioned sense that were the physical damage or the you know, the disconnect that putting a child sitting down immobile or nearly immobile uh, or at least restricted mobility for so long does. And, you know, just like physical fitness, I think it, there were, you know, some weird or just some, you know, some huge blind spots in terms of my physical maintenance that I didn't even notice about until I was well into my 20s. Um, well, Exercise. Okay, so between too, eighteen and tw between eighteen and twenty, I gained a hundred pounds from the way that I allowed myself to eat, not knowing any better. Once I was on my own and like doing my own thing, so and then I had to spend two years losing a hundred pounds. So, like that's that's definitely a good point and a huge huge subject. Uh, actually, body hate or body dysphoria, not feeling good in your own body, is connected to all the negative feelings you have about everything else that's embodied. <laughs> But that's the side sub subject we can maybe I didn't mean to cut in too bad there, but I just had to throw that out because my own experience is exactly that to a drastic degree. Yes. And and, you know, the freshman 15. Right. I mean, where does this come? It comes from, you know, in, in the modern West, childhood is extended not just to like 12 or 13, which is actually much longer than even medieval children. I mean, the concept of this extended childhood is, is actually a rather modern idea. Um, I mean, child, childhood itself is an 18th century idea. Um, and, but then you have this extended childhood until, you know, whatever, 20, 25, maybe even longer. And, and you know, this is why you have this interpersonal parent-child, you know, stress, which is assumed to happen, because you have in the modern and uh, West, you have uh, this mindset which was appropriate to a, f uh, a five year old and is continued up until, you know, 17 or 18 years old. And of course, you're going to have tension when you have this unnatural assumption that, you know, a 16 or 17 year old is a child. You nailed it, man. We have a society of babies in adult bodies. Their psychological <laughs> development has been arrested by the That's arrested by wow. society. And I do blame, I mean, I do blame society for arresting their development be to begin with. But then at a point, it becomes each person's choice about whether or not they want to want to get their head above water or not. But it's hard. The further you're drowning under deep delusion, deluge of delusion, the harder it is to swim to the surface. You might even not even know what direction is up anymore at a certain yeah, point. Maybe. And you think that you're making progress and then you're actually going deeper. But I like to say that if you just expand in all directions, you'll eventually reach the air. <laughs> and that's something that that's we're right. totally capable of doing, working on ourselves in a well, 
rounded way. But one of the key, I mean, physical activity has a lot to do with this. Confidence in your own body has a lot to do with this. One of the key things that is brought up in the Gatto essay is that he was looking at the education systems of more what you would call elite. I like to call them the L-lights, <laughs> the more elite families in Europe, how they taught their children. And they would just leave, leave the kid alone for long periods of time. Like, you just figure this out or it's going to be bad for you. Like you got to figure out how to ride this horse back from where we're dropping you off by yourself. And you have to jump over jumps and you have to like, you just don't screw up. And then you're putting the kid through trials by fire. And these are actually like rites of passage that are crucial to any human society that understands how to create functional adults or adepts in, in the world. It, it, these rites of passage are huge because they're confidence builders. If you've like, I mean, as a metaphor, if you've disarmed like a nuclear bomb at the age of nine years old and then like you're 40 years old and some punk in a black dress, I mean, robe is like telling you in a court of law, this or that, like you're going to have a whole different level of confidence and decide, well, I'm just going to find out how to how to deal with you and you'll you'll figure it out. You'll know that you can figure anything out you need to even under pressure. And so that's actually what it means to have self-knowledge. Self-knowledge is realizing <laughs> the ultimate self-knowledge you can get is that, guess what? You're actually limitless. The thing in the universe or in the reality that is the, the intelligent creative spark, the divine spark, the source itself, that infinite thing is inside of you. So that means that no matter what, you can actually reply or respond in any situation, any way you want, even things where you think you've only got a binary option. There's always at least a third position and a fourth, which is either both or neither. And you might only think that you got A or B. And that's a, a big part of taking out this idea of the trivia. And part of you, you brought up the kids not having the same teacher for more than a few months when it gets into higher education, where you just have like a semester with the teacher. This is a big deal because the, one of the ways of, com, of conceptualizing the idea of the trivium or the Holy Trinity, the, what's required to actually bring the spirit of the creator of source into whatever equation you've got is the third part, the balancing point. And that's known as the heart or care. And whenever you are with someone for a long enough amount of time, you develop, you start to kind of care about them. Even if you've resisted it, a certain level of intimacy could possibly build the longer that you're familiar with somebody and the more you know about their life and the more you, you'll just develop natural levels of higher empathy for them because empathy is actually just the perception of what's there. So the more you know about them and the more time you've spent observing them, the more empathy you have for them in that, like, you literally start to know what they're thinking or how they're feeling that day. You can read their body language or whatever. So what's going on in public school is that you have one teacher with a whole gang of kids and at, at most for a year. And that teacher is already dealing with kids who are approaching her with a persona because she's an authority figure. They're already coming to that teacher with a mask of like, I'm good, I'm obedient, I'm compliant. But then when you're not looking, I'm totally eating this glue or whatever. And I mean, they get to that point where they actually realize that, okay, I have a mask for this situation. I have a mask at home. I have a mask for in front of these friends and in front of these friends. And this is totally symbolic and represented in the fact that everyone's literally wearing masks around everywhere right now and that you have an online persona. You have your online digital profile picture and that's a mask because you put it through filters or you did whatever editing to make your booty look the way you want it or, or whatever. So it's like we're literally putting a mask on a mask on a mask on a mask on a mask and it's just can going to continue to fractally can mask itself repeatedly until we realize what it is at the bottom of the mask, which is limitless, which is uh, sovereignty, which is act absolute truth is actually within you. And you, <laughs> it's the only place you can find it other than to recognize how it's reflected in nature, but it's also inside you. And this is like the human is the embodiment of all nature into one thing. Like we're the, al we are the alchemical cabinet. And whenever things are out of balance inside of ourselves too much of one thing we're missing another thing then we can't even function correctly our intelligence gets off our our we become lethargic or we become depressed or whatever and we need to realize that like our own greatest work of alchemy or transmutation is in our own body and that when we get everything theoretically we're like a star we should have a little bit of every element in us we are we are like that and we that's why we're like in the image of the universe, you could say, because we contain it all and even on a chemical chemistry level. So getting your, alchemy, your alchemical cabinet back 
restocked with the right supplies and in the right balance and in the right order and, and cleaning out the gunk from the filters and all that with internal cleansing. These are the type of things that should have been taught to you by a real education system, a real teacher, a real educator is they would be like, OK, if you eat like this, this is the result you're going to get. But of course, it's not one size fits all because we're all different. So you need to understand how these different principles apply to your health and to food and to diet and all that. And this is really the real alchemy and how different herbs could be used and all that. And this is all knowledge that's being rapidly deleted from the human memory banks as we go further and further into Google, a Google controlled knowledge reality. But the point is a real teacher would be helping you get a grasp on how your actual vehicle that you're in operates. And because that's going to influence how you are spiritually, emotionally, intellectually, all of those things. It's like the foundational core thing. So like running around in the gym playing dodgeball for 45 minutes, three times a week is not the same thing. My health teacher, when I was in high school, he was famous for being a really fun teacher because all I did was tell stories about how cool he was in high school for the 45 <laughs> minutes that we were in class. And we learned Jack about health, like nothing, nothing at all. So, I mean, these are my experiences and I know that they're mirrored by other people. And the fact is that like what's moving us closer into this transhuman uh, future of becoming literally like digitized and robotic is that the heart, which is also the logic, which is also the processing, which is also the care, which is also the divine feminine or the mother or the goddess. This is all the thing that's been systematically attempted to be removed from our equation so that we become just input output. But the way that you get to the point where it's actually more fun for you to exist in an online persona than in reality is when your body degrades to the point where you're not that good at reality anymore. You, you don't you're not that agile. You know, you can't play b-ball with your friends or, or whatever. I mean, it's a stupid example as well. But just the fact is like the, the displeasurable feeling of being in people's bodies, especially the older they get, leads to all the psychological outputs that we see in their vitriol towards the world because they're expressing displeasure with themselves ultimately. And we, and when we see transhumanism replacing body parts or augmenting body parts, or even like someone that gets a whole lot of, I saw a girl, the Facebook page was called satanic dolls. And someone had shared this picture of a girl and I'm not like, this is not a judgment against this girl, but I think she was literally like 20 years old and she had over 80% of her body covered in tattoo ink and most of it was just solid black like not even a design and so this is what i mean like this is transhumanism it doesn't look like it but it's actually the fact that like this person probably felt like their life would not be in some way complete or valid or worth it unless they had this notoriety from doing this thing with their body or their body's not good enough how it is so they need to change it in some way or another i need a boob job i mean i'm not throwing stones at females specifically here because men have elements of this type of behavior too. I mean, that, that's the, the ultimate question though, is like even, even gender dysphoria is connected to this, the displeasure of being in your own body. And it starts as a kid. It starts uh, with experiences people have as a kid and then like pushed down and it gives them a overall low hum feeling of negativity or sadness. And then they learn to just let that be the baseline. And then they get to the age of 30 or something and they don't even know when they're depressed. I'm this person like I I can't even admit to myself when I'm depressed because when I'm behaving in a way like a like I'm having some kind of depression, it's always linked to not having the right healthy routine and and rhythms I actually don't even accept that I'm depressed. The behavior is evident that I'm acting like I'm depressed. I'm not doing the things I love as much. I'm not as vibrant as a person. But in my mind, I'm just like, yeah, another day. I'm just killing time getting through it. And it's like this neutral. So like, that's the heart being taken out of it. You're not even processing the feeling of what it is that you're doing right now. You're just like going through the motions and you feel like, oh, I'm not depressed. I'm just, you know, normal. I'm normal. I'm just a normal guy today. You know, so this is all coming back to the body. And like, that's the ultimate solution is align the body with the example of nature as much as possible. And other things will actually just start to kind of fall into place for you, or you'll at least have the energy and the awareness to see where things need to be put into place. And then that's bringing your body back into balance alchemically. And he has a fractal image of the cosmos, the reality you experience externally will actually have an as above, so below, as within, so beyond, or so without reaction to you putting yourself in balance. And that's going to be a whole different universe that you're in the closer to balance you get, especially from where you started as like, you know, one of, one of the hive mind that we all basically are kind of started out as in this video game called life.
I want to read one final selection from John Otto's 1990 presentation. And Chance, I'd like you to respond to it. I think it's riffing off of, off of certain themes you've brought up. And um, in particular, respond to it. In, in light of COVID-19 and these ongoing endless uh, shutdowns and, and uh, all the emotional trauma that's causing for children. And then um, I would invite any, any closing um, thoughts you would like to bring up before we, we um, wind things down. So um, my turn. Uh, here's the quote, and then we'll, we'll uh, head back to chance there. So John Gatto says at his uh, reception in 1990, quote, the children I teach, and he taught in New York City, are uneasy with intimacy and candor. My guess is that they are like many adopted people I've known in this respect. The children he knows are like adopted children insofar as they cannot deal with genuine intimacy because of a lifelong habit of preserving a secret inner self inside a larger outer personality made up of artificial bits and pieces of behavior borrowed from television or acquired to manipulate teachers. Because they are not who they present themselves to be, the disguise wears thin in the presence of intimacy. So intimate relationships have to be avoided. So please respond to that chance, and particularly in this, this pivotal moment um, that we find ourselves in, where clearly some powers that be are are trying to reorganize things, but we can snatch the brand from the fire. Well, well, man, I, it makes me sad. Like I literally feel sad. And that's how I know that my heart works, which I guess is good. But when you were talking about this intimacy thing, I'm just like, a kid shouldn't even be worried about that. A kid should be so just living and alive that they are what they are. I am what I am. That should be what the kid is. They should not even have this idea. I mean, they do it unconsciously. It's a defense mechanism. I get it. And it's actually a, a useful defense mechanism in earlier phases of humanity where the authority figure would beat your ass if you stepped out of line. So I get why kids are this way and then why we keep this mask and persona alive. But human touch and human, human touch is a big part of human intimacy. And the fact is, there's just not enough of that going around. Just a little pat on the shoulder, a little hug or whatever. I mean, now people that I am good friends with, when I see them, they want to like bump elbows instead of shaking hands or hugging. And I'm like, I, okay. I mean, I, how, how does that? Okay, I'll just go with it. But the, it makes me sad. It makes me sad that kids that are highly sponge-like at an early age, they're not seeing their, especially like babies and toddlers, they're not seeing other people's facial expressions and cues. They're not learning from that. We are, we are creating a generation right now that many people within it might not have the ability to process empathy in a healthy, normal way. Like the programming that's natural programming, learning what facial expressions and ticks and things like that mean what and how someone's receiving you or whatever, like that natural, that natural rhythm of exchange with the world and with other members of the world is rapidly going away and being replaced with the idea that you could hurt me. You could hurt me. You might rape me. You might mug me. You might get me sick. Any of these things are constantly being pounded into the kid's consciousness. And it's, it's so uh, it sucks, dude. It really sucks. Like there's nothing else I can say about it. I mean, people other than that, it sucks and that people should hopefully catch on to this sooner than later, but it's obviously like we're here in September and all this is still going on. So it's not, I'm kind of disappointed with the general level of humanity right now. I mean, again, it, I, I, if this makes you mad, I'm sorry, but like I'm the only person at the grocery store when I go there this afternoon, that's not wearing a face diaper and I have not hurt anybody. I promise. I know for a fact, truthfully that I have not harmed anybody by not put, covering my face, not putting on the mask. I, I know that to be true. And so if, if I can know that to be true, but I'm still looked at as potentially a danger, like people will walk by, this only happened a couple of times where someone might walk by and make the comment of like, I thought it was the law or whatever. And I'm just, I'm just like, that's the thing that you're worried about right now when 
you're worried about me not wearing this mask when just five feet away, there's a kids sitting in this shopping cart where their parents are wearing the masks and everyone around them is wearing the masks and they're being conditioned to believe that all this deadly danger is around every corner and uh, behind every person's eyes is like a possible threat. And this is as far from, this is pushing us even farther and farther away from the idea of like human charity, which is the required thing that must exist for commerce to not be the main driver of human behavior. So we really have to get that in mind is that charity is actually <laughs> like in, the reason why it's godly, if you will, is because it allows charity is like required under the natural law to even function. If we didn't have it, then we would be it would be anarchy. It is a natural law aspect because uh, we, we've got to be able to just do the right thing for the person in front of us, including for ourselves at all times. Like the way that I uh, do my best to keep this mindset, but of course I, I fall out of it at different times. But the way I like to try to communicate with myself and look at myself is as a parent to the child. And like my, my ego self or my body, those things are the child. And then like the part of me that decides things and reacts to things, that's like the parent and is loving. I try not to be too hard on myself when I screw up, but I also try not to let myself go too far <laughs> on one thing or another. I'm, I'm a pretty lenient parent, but that's sort of the way that my relationship with my mind works. And even when my mind in the past would used to kind of give me trouble, I'd have repetitive thoughts or worry about that. I feel like I've really graduated from that kind of stuff. And my mind is my ally. I think that that's part of what we need to do as well is make our minds into our ally and tell the, the mind is like a child really already. And it can be, obviously we know it can be programmed, but we can self-program the mind and it puts our orders on priority above all other things. Your conscious mind programming, your unconscious mind with just simple commands is actually goes to the top of the chain of commands in, in your mental hierarchy. Unless I guess you're like really dysfunctional, but I don't think that's true. I think that you're sovereign will is like the, going to top any other external commands you give to yourself. So you tell your mind, Hey mind, I have a game for you. You like to play games, right? Let's play this game where every time I think like a judgmental thought about another person or I act out of fear or whatever thing you want to give it, recognize that pattern, please. You're great at pattern recognition. And then that mind will start recognizing the pattern for you. Like here's a time where you decided instead of feeling the or thinking the thought train you were on, you decided to go grab a cigarette or, or uh, open a beer or whatever. And just program, tell your mind the program you want to run and the game you want to play and let it do that for you. And realize that, that that's actually what makes you limitless is that you can go in any direction you want and multiple directions at once. So what the last thing I want to quote from that, that uh, essay, man, it was such a good essay. We we're talking about the idea of challenges and rites of passage. This is huge. And this is something that now you have to create for yourself. They call it self-initiation. And you have to continually create rites of passage for yourself and recognize them as such and appreciate them for what they are. And, you know, whenever you overcome something, really, really realize that that means that you can stay over that thing and you don't have to fall back into it. Or if it comes back into your life, you, you've already done this once, you can do it again or whatever the case may be. But rites of passage, super important for building the confidence to like, you know, successfully live as a happy and healthy person or human or man or woman. And the words, <laughs> those words all have so much meaning. They're all copyrighted. But uh, OK, so he says one of my former students, Roland, though both his parents were dead and he had no inheritance, took a bicycle across the U.S. alone when he was hardly out of boyhood. Is it any wonder then that in manhood, manhood, when he decided to make a film about Nicaragua, although he had no money and no prior experience with filmmaking, that it was an international award winner, even though his regular work was as a carpenter? So there you go. A guy whose regular work is a carpenter, he was an orphan. He decided that he was going to make a film about Nicaragua and do a good job. And he did a great job, it sounds like. And obviously the link here that is being made by Gatto is that this guy self-initiated a rite of passage of riding a bike across the country. Can you raise your hand if you've done that? Anybody? No, I don't think you have. Maybe a couple of you out there. Man, I want to know what else you've done if you've done that. So create these type of challenges for yourself and realize too that it doesn't have to be all. This is another 
platitude that I feel like is really important is that you actually part of the plague mentally is that we set the bar too high and we try to run the race too fast. And we need to get into the, we need to realize as a people that what you do consistently and every, what you do every day is literally who you are, believe it or not. So if you think that you want to be a writer, don't think that you need to write a book, think that you need to write every day and that'll shift. And so set the bar way lower instead of being like, I got to bang out 5,000 pages by 8 PM today, or I'm a failure. Instead, just say, I'm going to write a couple of sentences every day. And then if I end up doing more than that, great. But if I can just make sure I write a couple of sentences every day, I'll feel good about that. So it's a very easy win and you feel good about the win. And then there's even better feeling because you're guaranteed that once you sit down, you're not just going to be like, well, wait, one more thing and one more thing and you'll go further. But there's no like point. There's no like a quota. You don't need to set yourself quotas that are so unreasonable that it makes you never begin. And that's coming from a real place of experience. And I know for a fact, and like, I mean, sometimes you got to take breaks from things, but consistency is key. And even if it's just a little bit at a time, if you write for 15 minutes a day for a year, uh, how's that going to look compared to telling yourself you need to write a book and never starting? Absolutely. I think in this moment where uh, we'll say certain negative forces are very much on the push and certain forces which have spent about 200 years maneuvering things uh, to this type of artificiality are, have made a major push this year under the guise of, of health. We, all of us need to, as those of us trying to operate on a higher wavelength, to use that imagery, need to find ways to think differently. And that counsel from chance is going to be very helpful as uh, those as a bus of light, prepare for our pushback against what has happened, the type of damage this past year, the society before it in, in a long preparation has drifted towards. So we need to, all of us, uh, check our, our nonsense and, and humble down a bit and take some good advice, like Chan says, and, and really reevaluate things and reevaluate the ways that we approach things and realize that we were thought to think in a certain way and let us challenge those things. Absolutely, man. This has been a fun conversation too, John. I'd, I'd love to do it again sometime on any topic and you're definitely a well researched individual yourself. And I can feel the intention to elevate the consciousness of humanity from you. And, you know, it's a, it's a good feeling to know there's other people out there with the same idea that all we have to do is change our thinking first and then we can change our behavior and then we can get a different outcome. Absolutely. Chance, please stay on here as I do the sign off, but can you tell us where we can find your work once again? Oh yeah. I may not have even mentioned it to begin with, but it's interversepodcast.com. I talk to people in conversations, not unlike this type of style. And I, aim for a weekly show, usually pull that off. And I've been at it for a couple of years. Like you said, I've interviewed Clint, but also there's just a good variety of people on there from the artistic and alternative arts communities to philosophical podcaster, YouTubers and authors. And I'm really excited about what I do in those conversations because they help me progress forward and they are my rite of passage towards a higher level of wisdom and more understanding and so I, I would love to share those conversations with more people. Interversepodcast.com will have links to all the different platforms where you can grab the show from. There's video versions of the episodes on YouTube. There's BitChute, of course, uh, brand new tube. I'm on social media, alternative sites like Minds.com, but also on Facebook and Instagram. Probably most active on Instagram, really, because <laughs> I, I mean, I may hate the masters of that application, but I... Can't, uh, compared to stuff like Facebook and others, it's actually a pretty functional way to communicate with people <laughs> without too many distractions. Uh, there's also an Interverse Discord channel that you can find a link to on the website. And yeah, so it's everywhere that you might want to get a podcast. Check it out. There's something for everybody in the content of that show. Been at it for a while and it's a lot of fun, but it's especially fun for me to get to have the tables turn and do 
a lot of talking as a guest and get myself thinking about these topics instead of being in question mode. I loved this chat and it did help me bring out and flesh out my own ideas. And so something like this in the future, I'd love to do it again if you'd like to. And I'd like to say thanks to everybody that was checking out the live stream and that listens later. Uh, John and Bruce, I see you guys in the chat here. The StreamYard thing's pretty neat. I've been thinking about switching to it actually. So I may, I may start that experiment soon, but yeah, this is a blast and I uh, really appreciate you giving me the chance here and also for being so cool about me missing our original intention time, which was last night. I was, uh, <laughs> I'm getting back into the gym because I, I got the COVID-19 uh, pounds, not actually the, the virus, <laughs> kind of like the freshman 15 you talked about. But seriously, they wouldn't let me go to a gym for months. And then when they opened back up, it was like, you got to have, you got to wear your diaper to come in here. And I'm just like, I can't exercise that way. But I finally opened up in a, a membership with a gym in a suburb town outside of my town that I've only only got about a 16 minute drive to get to. So that's acceptable. And then when things blow over, I'll be able to go to other locations of that gym closer to myself and other parts of the, the state. But it's a big thing. Like I wasn't working out or exercising properly for months and I let the COVID be my excuse. But the truth is I could have been doing it at home in different ways. I could have been motivated, but you know, we all go through this type of rhythm in life and important thing is that just like that kid that's in the elite education system who's being taught how to ride a horse at the age of eight, you got to get back on the horse if you fall off. That's all that really matters is that you get back on. And even if it's been a long time, you can always get back on and you will keep falling off at different points And because it's a bumpy road being alive in 2020. But why would we want it to be challengeless? In a sense, that's actually the direction that they want to train you. The uh, those who are the social engineers. I do have, I know we're trying to wrap this up, but I do have one more quote. We need to rethink the fundamental premises of schooling and decide what it is we want all children to learn and why. For 140 years, the nation has tried to impose objectives downward from the lofty command center made up of experts, a central elite of social engineers. So that's what it is. Don't let yourself be socially engineered by experts. Realize that expert is a flattering title and that actually... The only thing that you can know is true is what is self-evident in your reality and that you've experienced. And that doesn't mean you can't trust people, but you need to like really go heavy on your own experience <laughs> and, and to take that quite seriously. But yeah. Okay. We'll wrap this up though, if you're ready and everybody, thanks for listening. And it's been a fun conversation. I love getting into these flow states and hope to do it again sometime. Absolutely, we will, Chance. Stay on here. Uh, speaking of elite education, if anyone's interested in an undergraduate education that isn't of the mainstream but is quite thorough uh, to verb knowledge and not just to noun it, uh, please check out apocastastasisinstitute.wordpress.com and you can find out all about our course and our classes and our tutoring and in person and online and all that stuff. So thanks again, Chance, and thanks again, everyone, for watching.